Habitat fragmentation is a big one. I mean, highways um, is pretty huge. Dense cities, all of these things can really kind of cut up the available habitat for bears. Um, their activity alone is enough to change bear behavior. We have a lot of evidence in recent studies that show that they're actually changing their nocturnality based on human presence and trying to avoid humans. So they're kind of changing the, the hours that they're awake and asleep. Um, and food attractants are, are really, really big. Um, obviously that energetically changes things for all animals and, um, we, we see larger animals in touristic areas because they're able to access these abnormally high calorie foods that don't exist in nature. And that has subsequent effects on their behavior where they're going to, you know, quickly realize that seeking out those food sources might be worth the risk and the fear of being around humans. Because if you can go eat a cheeseburger and that's your, your budget for the whole <laughs> next couple of days, that's a lot easier than grazing on berries for days and days. Hello and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Wasteless Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has the goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 140, we enter bear country. Now we've talked about bears on the show before with bear biologist Garrett Tavi, and that episode is a must listen if you're planning to enter bear country and want to know some practical bear safety tips. In this episode, we sit down with another bear biologist, but this time we have a chance to hear about the bigger picture of bear conservation as a whole and what we can do to better coexist with larger predators like bears. Sydney Stevens is an experienced biologist with expertise in research, teaching, and outreach. Her work spans diverse fields, including biology, chemistry, and geography. She's authored scientific publications, articles, and blogs alongside grant writing and reviewing. She's passionate about community outreach and engages in guest lectures and museum tours and has worked internationally and with incarcerated populations. Fieldwork highlights include studying bears, sheep, and lions across Lake Tahoe, India, and Kenya, and she's currently conducting research on wild bear populations in Italy and the Yellowstone region of the United States. So thank you for joining me on the Outdoor Minimals podcast today, Sydney. I am excited to be learning more about your work from you. I've followed your work for quite some time, and I think a lot of the audience will be interested in your conservation efforts. So before we talk about all of that, um, let's just do kind of a brief intro to who you are and some of your passions a lot outside of just bears. Um, so how did you become interested in outdoor recreation as an activity in your life, and how does it fit in now? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It's yeah, a privilege to be here. You run a great podcast, and I'm excited to be a guest. Um, to answer your question, I think it's always been a part of my life. I've been someone that's been pretty lucky to grow up with parents that are outdoorsy and have always incorporated hiking and camping into my childhood. And I think growing up in the Western U.S. has helped that a lot, too, because there's just so much wilderness to go be in. Um, I mostly grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and so the access to mountains really shaped me as a kid. Um, and then I spent the other half of my childhood in Oregon. And so the forests there and the coasts um, really created this holistic desire to be in all these different types of ecosystems, including the deserts in Utah. Um, and there's just so many different ways that you can interact with nature. Um, I think for me, it really started off as just enjoying hiking and stopping and smelling the roses and looking at all the different plants and animals and always hoping that I would see more animals and then um, progressed as I got older to more technical sports and, um, you know, skiing and 
um, really what changed everything for me was getting into rock climbing. That's I think when I became even more outdoorsy per se than it was before and just kind of always wanted to be out finding a climb and um, enjoying nature in that way, interacting with geology in that way. And is that kind of love for the outdoors? Is that what inspired you to pursue a career in conservation? And I am mostly also curious what drew you to large carnivores? <laughs> yeah, um, definitely to a degree. I think it's kind of a chicken or the egg kind of question because I've always loved animals um, just intrinsically for their how they are, their existence. Um, but I've also always loved nature and I don't know if it was experiencing wildlife that led me to liking animals or if it was um, liking animals that led me to wanting to be outside. <laughs> um, but for, for large carnivores, um, I've tried to answer that question before. I don't know when that specifically began. I think like a lot of people, um, I found myself attracted to the charismatic megafauna, as we call them, because um, they end up just being such an iconic species in so many different settings. They're often the main characters in stories. I think, you know, growing up with things like The Lion King and Fox and the Hound, like Disney movies, um, really impacted me as a kid and really made me interested in animals and that anthropomorphizing of them, seeing their emotions made me realize that animals have emotions and they have lives and experiences just like we do. And I, I became really curious with that. I think I did get fixated on carnivores when I was really young, though, because um, I was like really, really scared of the big bad wolf <laughs> when I was little, like would have nightmares about it all the time. And um, and I, I don't know what prompted it totally, but I decided to like overcome that fear by creating an imaginary friend called Wolfie and making wolves like friendly and awesome. And um, like through that experience, I started sympathizing with the wolf and realizing that he just needed to eat too. And he wasn't inherently evil. He was just <laughs> trying to survive. And so I think that those kind of initial ways of thinking um, made me consider large carnivores at an early age. And that led me to my career ultimately. Yeah. So let's explore your career a little bit more. So, I mean, there's that early interest in animals and large carnivores specifically, but then you went on to study and are continuing research um, with bears primarily is what I see, but I'm sure you study other animals as well. Um, so what was that progression like? And did you initially attend university for these things? Yeah, um, so originally I wanted to be a wildlife veterinarian and was really interested in the, um, like, saving animals and treating them medically for whatever ailments they were experiencing. So um, I started my undergraduate career as pre-vet and was working in veterinary clinics for a few years and, and had the ultimate goal of going to vet school and, um, and then transitioning into a mixture of wildlife research and wildlife medicine. Um, but after a few years of working in clinics, I started doing the research part um, as part of my degree. And it really only took like a month of working in a research lab to realize that this was what I wanted to do in this, this type of career and type of day to day per se, um, even though there, there's not really a uniform day to day in research. Um, what was the most exciting and fulfilling for me and that there was a lot of kind of, kind of unfortunate hurdles and structures around being in, in veterinary medicine that I thought would really take away from why I was wanting to be there in the first place. Um, so yeah, I really just found my calling in research and have just absolutely enjoyed being in it ever since. Um, I started working in a behavioral and nutritional ecology lab um, and that was mostly with different wild rodent species. And that was a really cool experience because I got to learn so many scientific methods and um, scientific writing and analysis. And I had such great mentors during that time that that really just propelled me forward to be um, independent in a lot of other scenarios that I, I wouldn't have been able to if I didn't have that foundation of mentors. Um, 
So I, I just can't speak enough to the importance of mentors, probably in any field, but especially in science. Um, so having having their uh, guidance kind of built that foundation for me really allowed me to go work in other labs that had more large carnivore stuff going on, but maybe not as much guidance. Um, and so I did take some of those methodologies and and go start uh, a different study pretty independently in a different lab. And that was somewhat by chance. I was definitely kind of looking for it because I knew that I wanted to transition into working with large carnivores. Um, but I was at my university's field station in near Castle Valley, Utah, um, for an unrelated reason and had been hearing that there was rumors of bears being in the area for the, the two weeks that we had been there. And um, the professor I was with was like, I'm pretty sure that the field station manager is just pulling our legs like there's not bears in this area. This is the desert and not that they're not ever in the desert, but not here. And it was like within a few hours of him saying that, that we had rounded the corner and there was a mom and her two cubs um, just in the road. And th these were American black bears, which can be either brown or black or um, in other areas, gray and white even. But the mother was brown and one of the cubs was brown and they had taken off running before we had even fully seen them. And so we kind of just saw the back, their backsides taking off. <laughs> and the other cub though was this little scruffy black cub. And it just sat in the road, totally unfazed by our presence, just very curious, sitting on its haunches with its paw up and its head cocked and was just very perplexed and curious. And it wasn't until it realized that it was being left in the dust by its family that it was like, oh, I guess I should be scared and run away. But um, that that really stark contrast of the reactions between these two siblings um, prompted another sort of nature versus nurture question for me and how different individuals and different carnivores will interact with the landscape and interact with people and um, ultimately lead to desirable or undesirable events with people. Um, so that really started my whole career with bears was that moment. Um, <laughs> and um, I designed a study around seeing if the bears were just passing through the area as they sometimes do to go to neighboring populations or if they were actually staying there long term and living there and using the resources there. And if we could expect um, them to be more present as the climate changes and as there's more tourism. Um, and then, yeah, once I, once I started working with bears, um, it's a small world with, it's a, there's a bear bubble. And so I just kind of kept meeting bear biologists and kept getting really cool research opportunities after that. Um, and then also with other species, which has been really, really cool. Yeah. That's really interesting that, that, I don't know, I guess the universe kind of put you in the right place at the right time and kind of jump started your career and focus on bears specifically. So if we zoom out and look at bear conservation as a whole, then um, I know that your research will sometimes have like a niche focus, but at a high level, what is the overarching goal of bear conservation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think researchers inherently um, find themselves in niches just by the nature of time and energy that you have and um, ability to focus on any one category at a time. But um, I think we're all working towards the same goal, which is a sort of harmonization of any ecology. And for, for me, bears are often a keystone species, and that's a term we use it's um, based off the the keystone block when you're building like an arch or a bridge where everything's leaning and supporting itself, but it's kind of that final piece that that keeps it all together and taking it out makes it all fall apart. And there's been criticism on that because it is an oversimplification. And in reality, every species is important to upholding the balance of an ecosystem. But there are some species that um, just have their their legs in so many different aspects of their ecosystem that their presence or absence is really felt and you can really see those effects on a lot of other species um, and even abiotic factors like uh, stream formation and soil um, ecology which isn't totally abiotic but um, so for me looking at looking at bear conservation of course I'm personally concerned with the individual bears and their experience and I want them to leave happy, healthy lives and um, be in the environment that they belong in. 
but it's also um, stands to promote health within their ecosystem as a whole. They really play a vital role in um, seed dispersal where, because they're omnivorous and very opportunistic, they're eating a lot of plants and then they're moving much larger, larger distances than other plant eaters like small rodents do. So they're able to really uh, change the range of plants um, on a small level. And that's really important to e the ecosystem. Um, they, because they're also predators, they keep a lot of prey populations in control so that they're not overgrazing and um, ultimately starving themselves and their competitors out of a food source. Um, sorry, I have a cat. She's always a little involved in the conversation. <laughs> That's fine. Um, <laughs> um, they're also ecosystem engineers because they do a lot of digging. They aerate the soil by exposing it to oxygen, and that can uh, really change the health of soils and ultimately how much plants are going to grow. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot, a lot more things, but I, I think that, um, people's ab ability to exist with bears is also important. I think that they have intrinsic value that some people already recognize and some people are seemingly just born loving bears and loving wildlife and they don't really have to like learn that or be taught that. But for a lot of people, um, when you learn to enjoy wildlife, it is really life changing and it really has an existential impact on you and uh, really changes the way that you interact with the land and value yourself as an animal. So I think they're they're really valuable in that aspect, too. Um, and yeah, I mean, I could go on, but I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, there's so much that we could learn <laughs> about bears, but I think that appreciation is maybe what most people would identify with. Um, and then beginning to learn more about the general impact bears have in a positive way. And so if we look at your research specifically, um, you're currently recording this interview in Italy and are working with brown bears in the Alps. So what is your main focus with that study and what are you hoping to achieve? Yeah, so um, I just started working on this project and it's really a, a great opportunity. It's a very cool um, system. It's something I'm a lot newer to because I've mostly worked with bears in North America and India. Um, the, the main purpose of it is that brown bears went locally extinct through most of Europe. Um, quite a while ago, it, it, it really varies depending on the area. In some areas, they've been absent since like the 1500s um, and in others, they they were extirpated by the late 18, early 1900s. They were reintroduced in the late 90s, early 2000s using a few bears from Slovenia that were brought into Italy and released um, in hopes to revitalize the population here. Um, so we started off with 10 bears and, and that's where the population stood in about 2000, 2002. Flash forward 20 years later, we're looking at about 100 bears in the area, which is great. Um, they're definitely successful in that sense, but they've been pretty constrained to this particular region in Italy. And the ultimate goal, um, at least in, from my perspective, <laughs> of course, not everyone has the same ideas, but the ultimate goal is for them to reoccupy all of their historic range and be um, present in the Alps. Maybe not 100% their historic range, but a, a large amount of it so that they are part of that ecosystem predominantly again. Um, but there's lots of constraining factors that don't allow them to move across the landscape as they would have um, in the past. Namely, like highways is a really major um, component to habitat fragmentation where it just they're cut off and constrained from moving the way that they would without that factor. Um, but also people's social acceptance of bears and their attitudes towards carnivores ends up playing a much larger role than I think everyone is fully aware in their ability to move across the landscape because wildlife is managed by governments and they, they do have a lot of say and kind of how big a population gets, where it goes, 
the that is really informed often by public opinion. Um, of course, they try to put science first, but it is ultimately a human led organization. And, um, you know, we're all influenced by emotions and social pressure and governments are um, at least a lot of the good ones are <laughs> also really influenced by the opinions of their populace. So what we're trying to do is to first uh, map and quantify what these movement corridors for bears could be so we know where and how they can expand their range uh, physically or geographically. Um, and then second, look at how the social acceptance values and these human behaviors modifies that and, and changes that landscape in not a physical way, but this kind of imperceptible way that really does uh, Act, change their actual ability to move because of retaliation efforts by humans, um, for example. Yeah, yeah the, that idea of the public's perception and opinion surrounding the bears, especially in like a reintroduction effort, is fascinating. It makes a lot of sense. In Washington state, where I am, they there is talk, I'm sure they're actually doing this, but I haven't looked too deeply into it, of reintroducing um, brown bears into the North Cascades. And since I live close to the North Cascades, there's a lot of discourse in the community and things like that, like, oh, what would that mean? All those things, like, will it make hiking and backpacking more dangerous? I don't want that to happen. So it is interesting, kind of like the pushback that people might have. Um, with that idea or concept, even though we already have bears here. So <laughs> it's kind of a strange um, like thought process. Like if you add more bears, is that scarier to humans and why does that happen? But psychologically, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons. Adventuring plans on your calendar? Remember to grab your Lava Linens travel towel on your way out the door. Founded by a mother-daughter team, Lava Linens crafts durable, luxurious travel towels as a more sustainable and better performing alternative to microfiber and cotton towels. Powered by flax, hemp, and tensile, they're designed to be by your side for years to come. Use the code OUTDOORMINIMALIST for 15% off your next order. Speaking of North America, and you said most of your work um, has been in North America before this and India as well. But um, how does your work in the Alps kind of compare to that work in North America and then specifically your work in Yellowstone? Yeah, um, it's, it's very different in a lot of ways. I think what is really special about the Western US especially um, is how much wilderness there is. There's arguments that there's no like true wilderness in the world anymore because everything has some degree of human modification and influence, but there's at least a spectrum of it. And in the Western US especially, there is a lot of relatively untouched land, a lot of spaces that have um, really large distances between human features and human presence, where even if you're a really backcountry backpacker or climber, um, you're still not accessing a lot of these places and the people that do are few and far between. So there's a lot more space for animals to go and it's a lot easier, especially for recreationalists to support things that are wildlife driven because they can kind of compartmentalize, like the bears are gonna be over here, but they're probably not gonna be here and, you know, I, I know what I'm getting into if I go into the backcountry, I'm going to bring my bear canister and my bear spray. And um, there's kind of that more, more acceptance of like wilderness has animals and then these, you know, uh, like urban areas don't. And there's some areas in between where you might be conscious of it. But in in Europe, it's really not like that. They just don't have so much uh untouched land per se like there's refugios and little villages everywhere the history is just so much the human history there is so much uh longer in terms of like physical settlements and people that have been occupying like alpine areas and areas that would might otherwise be wilderness in the u.s so there's a lot more habitat fragmentation there's a lot more attachment to the landscape as a whole where there isn't just this we're gonna make this a wildlife preserve and people can go there. There's just not large enough areas of land for that so much in Europe as there is in the US. And so I think that makes it a lot harder in, in the social acceptance way because you can't just have it be this out of sight, out of mind for some people. Everyone is gonna be kind of involved in it, whether they're a recreationalist or not, whether they're an agriculturalist or not. 
they might just be, you know, someone that doesn't partake in either of those categories, but lives in a sleepy town in the mountains and they, they have to think about bears and that's not uncommon here. So that's really different. Um, I think organizationally, it's a little different in terms of the access to data. Yellowstone, um, I'm working with a group on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is both Yellowstone and the Tetons and a really large area surrounding that. Um, and that is, they the USGS has an interagency grizzly, grizzly bear study group that works with a lot of different organizations, state wildlife groups, and I'm just kind of luckily getting to collaborate with them. And it's phenomenal getting to do that because they have one of the largest databases I've ever seen for large carnivores. A really big hurdle with these large animals is having enough data because there's just not a lot of them there to study in the first place, especially in terms of like statistically significant levels where you want to have a lot of data to be able to make inferences. But then it's really hard to actually study them um, with with methods that accurately represent what they're doing, and it's hard to have funding for that. And they have just been really um, relative to a lot of other systems, well funded and consistent in how much they've been able to monitor brown bears and just have a lot of data over the last fifty plus years. Whereas it's a lot newer here, um, the data is newer. It's more inconsistent because there's less structure around it at the time and so learning to work with that on like a computational level is is a lot trickier too um and then and then the bears themselves are also just different like the bears in the yellowstone ecosystem will eat more fish and they are a little more used to people in in some way the ones that are in uh interfacing with people areas are a little more used to people and the ones that aren't stay away in the wilderness where the bears here can't totally do that. Um, and they they come from an area where they didn't have so much human interaction in, in Slovenia. And so I think there's a lot of learning from both the bears and the people of like what is acceptable and how they're going to dance around each other. Um, so yeah, that's that's my preliminary analysis of the difference between the two, but I'll get back to you in a few years when I have my dissertation written. <laughs> Sounds good. I look forward to that. Um, and I guess if we're kind of thinking in that train of thought then, have you noticed any trends or differences, just general themes in how humans are interacting with bears in those spaces then? Yeah, I think... Um, I think bear, I think we've had the time, um, particularly Yellowstone has a reputation for being a bear area. Um, so I think we've had the time to ingrain bear awareness and people more in that area. And most people aren't going to be hiking in the backcountry without bear spray in a lot of those zones. Um, they're generally good about their food. I say generally, there's a lot of exceptions, <laughs> um, but here it's a little more niche. They just haven't had as much time to adapt. They've only been here a few more, a few years. And so there's only a handful of people that have really either previously been educated or taken the time to educate themselves on how to recreate in bear country. Um, so I think there's a lot more fear here right now than there is in the US. Um, I think people hear me feel that it's, something that they can't totally escape if they want to be outside because because of those dynamics um whereas in the us i think some people will be like well i'll just hike in these areas and not those ones but i think here people are like i could be a mile from my house and might run into a bear you know so so i think that influences people's behaviors a bit and and the novelty of it does um yeah it's it's just newer here are there any specific influences that humans have? I mean, there's probably a lot because you already mentioned some of them. Um, so general influences that people have that impact bear populations and their habitats. So this could be negative or positive. I think one that you mentioned earlier was the highways. Yes. Yeah. Um, habitat fragmentation is a big one. I mean, highways um, is pretty huge dense cities, all of these things can really kind of cut up the available habitat for bears. Um, 
their activity alone is enough to change bear behavior. We have a lot of evidence in recent studies that show that they're actually changing their nocturnality based on human presence and trying to avoid humans. So they're kind of changing the, the hours that they're awake and asleep. Um, and food attractants are, are really, really big. Um, obviously that energetically changes things for all animals and, um, we, we see larger animals in touristic areas because they're able to access these abnormally high calorie foods that don't exist in nature. And that has subsequent effects on their behavior where they're going to, you know, quickly realize that seeking out those food sources might be worth the risk and the fear of being around humans. Because if you can go eat a cheeseburger and that's your your budget for the whole <laughs> next couple of days that's a lot easier than grazing on berries for days and days and um that's actually something that uh we've demonstrated in outreach events where we made this dungeons and dragons style bear game that we would have people play and um they time and time again chose to cross roads and go into campsites and be in in human settlements when they realized like oh it's so much easier to get 20 points for a cheeseburger than one or two points for a berry and you know or spend a couple hours fishing and get a few points for that and so animals submit themselves to more risk when that payoff seems to be there and sometimes that creates what we call an ecological trap where they're so attracted to an area because it, it seems like it's going to increase their fitness or make them healthier and more likely to reproduce um but ultimately the the risk of death there is so great that it ends up harming the population and acting as like a sink on on the population so that that's really difficult and and human behavior um in making those food attractants more easily available uh further promotes that because bears are they learn from their mothers and so if their mom is teaching them like you know, you can go eat at this person's orchard or you can find food in this garbage area, then that's going to be the behaviors that they grow up with and that they continue to teach to their offspring. Um, so, yeah, I think <laughs> not securing garbage, uh, sleeping in bear country with your food out and available, uh, things like that can be can be really detrimental in the long run. Yeah, food seems to be kind of a, a common factor or a really big motivation I guess I mean I guess yeah. it's kind of like when you're training an animal and you give them a food reward they'll remember that as like a positive reinforcement and so we do talk a lot about food management in the backcountry I think as recreationalists and so how can we better coexist with bears and other wildlife with food in mind but then also outside of that that's a great question. Yeah, I think I think food is definitely one of the main things that any person can quickly um, address as a recreationalist, just securing your food and making it not super accessible. If you're increasing the effort that's needed to access that food, then you're encouraging them to put that effort towards food that's more guaranteed and less risky for them. Um, so yeah, securing your food is, is huge. And then I think that there really can't be enough said for your own personal attitude towards wildlife and sort of keeping your fear in check in, in a way um, where you're educated to know what to do if you find yourself in a situation. Um, but also some of that education goes along with understanding the, the true risk of a lot of these situations. I think it's really easy with all of these childhood stories and, and the news highlighting all the times that things go wrong to feel like predators are this huge risk. And if you run into one, something's going to go really bad. Um, but the reality is most of those interactions don't turn out that way, even when people botch it and don't act the way that they're supposed to, because wildlife is afraid of you and they're afraid of each other too. They're not these vicious creatures that are just looking to fight and eat whatever they come across. They're always kind of weighing the balance between effort required, risk that it's going to cost them. Injury is a really big deal to wildlife because they don't have a vet or a doctor to go visit. And one little wound could be an infection that kills their life, kills them and their life. <laughs> um, so really, um, when knowing that when you encounter 
like a carnivore and not freaking out can completely change a scenario. And I've seen a lot of videos of people that know that and are really good with how they handle interacting with wildlife. And that just makes all the difference because wildlife uh, officials are really retaliatory towards towards wild, towards carnivores. If there's any threat to human life, they tend to get euthanized by the government. Um, and a lot of the times that's just not necessary. And a lot of the times it was the person's fault. <laughs> and so I think just being educated on what to do and not having an abnormally large uh, sense of fear that isn't relative to the actual risk and just kind of having respect for wildlife and knowing that they're just doing their best. And if you just kind of let them be, then they'll probably be okay with you and, and move on. Yeah, absolutely. And when I'm thinking about some of the videos that I have seen, um, like where people are reacting in a positive way and not necessarily harming the animal or anything like that, a lot of times comments will be like, oh, you should have been carrying a gun or a weapon or something like that. And I think that that kind of demonstrates from my perspective, a somewhat lack of education because from my understanding, like there are other methods like bear spray that are far more effective and like less harmful um, to the animals and can like teach them to just kind of stay away from humans because it is a negative experience without harming their life. So if you're willing to talk about the differences in um, like how a bear were, would react to a weapon like a gun versus something designed to deter bears like bear spray, I think that would be good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right on that. Um, guns are definitely not a good method to deal with bears in most cases, um, not just because it's an unnecessarily large threat to their life, um, but also because they're actually just not that effective. One, because people aren't usually as good of shots as they like to think that they are. And so they, and bears have really, um, really tough skin um, and they're very large and a lot of them is fat. And so the, the likeliness of hitting something that's vital and, and going to make the situation over quickly is, is pretty low. Um, and so really what you're doing is just kind of often just pissing them off more and putting yourself in a bad situation. Um, but otherwise just kind of letting them, die like a slow painful death from infection um or like a really slow bleed out and that's just really not ideal uh, of course you know maybe some people don't want the bear alive and that is their goal but um that's that's not mine <laughs> that's and i think that's not uh most people that knows what's going on ecologically's idea of a successful outcome either bear spray is really effective it's really a great tool um it poses very little actual harm to the bear um, but is an extremely negative experience. And so not only is it effective in the moment where as soon as they have the experience of, of the spray, um, they're going to get out of there. They're not going to pursue you anymore. And that's not even just a personal decision. It is like they are not able to just kind of blindly charge at you anymore. I don't know if you've ever like been maced. I accidentally maced myself once when I dropped my own like personal pepper spray on the ground you can't do stuff when you're <laughs> when you have pepper spray in your face um but it doesn't really pose long-term threat or harm to them and so they're able to go back occupy their ecological niche leave a lead a bear life and think like i don't think i'm gonna mess with humans anymore that was not fun or worth the risk <laughs> um i think that is also something that's a little difficult with Europe is bear spray is not legal in a lot of places in Europe um, because there's fear of people using that as a weapon against other humans. And so that definitely changes the dynamics of people um, recreating in Europe and feeling like they don't have the things they want to defend themselves. Luckily, there are some groups that are lobbying to try and change the laws around that so that we can increase wildlife uh, coexistence in that sense. But um, for people in the U.S. and other countries where it's legal, I definitely encourage you to carry bear spray with you in bear country. Um, but that's for when things go wrong. And again, like that's actually a pretty small percentage of the amount of times people interact with bears. And a lot of those interactions are not known to the human because wildlife tends to know you're there long before you do. And most of the time they're out of there before you even detect them. So when you 
have a negative experience with wildlife, it's usually because you've surprised them. And, you know, like a lot of these incidents are like mountain bikers because they just come through so fast that the the bear or whatever other animal doesn't hear them in time. Um, so having things like a bell can make all the difference. Um, traveling in groups so there's more noise makes a lot of difference. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to just really lower your chances of uh, in, of you encountering the bear and and that also keeps you safe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I do have another episode with another bear biologist that overviews like explicit details on the things that people should be doing when they're in bear country. Um, cause I think he works mostly up by Glacier National Park where there is awesome. a large bear population. So if people want like more details on that, they can listen to that one. If you've enjoyed listening to this interview and any of our other interviews on the Outdoor Minimals podcast, we'd love to hear from you. One super easy and free way to support our content is by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We thank you for listening to and supporting our work so that together we can create a better outdoor space as we recreate. If you were to choose, I guess, a call to action for listeners in regard to how they interact with wild spaces, especially spaces where bears live and that's their home, um, what would that be? Yeah, and, and I did listen to that episode and it was really well done. So I also encourage people to, to listen to that. Um, but actually mine, yeah, I think most of the obvious ones are the... Mm, more physical ones are covered and there's a lot of information out there for people on kind of what to do to stay safe in bear country. But if you're interested in contributing to like bear conservation as a whole, I, as cheesy as it sounds, would really encourage people to just talk with their loved ones and their friends about their views on bears and the things that they know and kind of knowledge share that way and increase empathy that way because we're so much more influenced by people close to us, um, especially over things that we're not seeking out. I think people that care about coexisting with wildlife and recreating safely in the outdoors are going to seek out that information and they're going to go find it. But there's a lot of people that don't and are, you know, either carelessly interacting with the environment or they're just kind of happen to be there and then they don't know what to do or they just aren't of the same mindset and so they're not introduced to some of the things that other people are and so really that that social spread and like social evidence of how to behave in uh, in bear country or just with wildlife in general and that you know wildlife have experiences and and desires just like you and me and increasing that empathy and that social acceptance in others um, and trying to minimize the fear that people feel and know what to do in those situations ends up having a really large effect that, you know, isn't easy to quantify because he, that would be a hard study to design, but we do know that people's social acceptance really changes, um, both human bear interactions and, uh, just their ability to occupy a landscape safely. Yeah. And as an aside, I guess, do you think, how do you think media can influence those perceptions? Because you mentioned earlier that a lot of times the media is covering like the bad things that happen, you know, like a bear attack or something like that. Yeah, that's really hard. Um, journalism is definitely a totally different art than science. And there's often a really big disconnect in how science is communicated with, with journalism. Um, so my preference would be would be like a breakdown of what went wrong and what could have gone better and and you know stats on the relevance of this incident to the bigger picture um but that's not always going to be practical um so what i would like to see is that for sure but also more uh <laughs> holistic coverage on things that are going right and animals just kind of existing in their environment without <laughs> negativity associated with humans. Um, I think having, uh, from a journalism perspective, having more coverage on 
cool ecological concepts and things that we're learning about animals and ways we realizing we can coexist with them is great. And, you know, news flashes about here's what to do in this situation. But from like a personal perspective, just being mindful of what you're sharing on social media. And if you are perpetuating um, certain links, if, you know, you can put your own caveats of like, in this situation, maybe we should be doing this. And doing that in like a negative or a shaming way is, is never productive or helpful. But um, just always trying to have empathy, not just for people, but for the animals that are involved really goes a long way in making people reconsider how they're viewing a certain situation. And, and yeah, just promoting, promoting how special the, the connection of everything is, I think is also plays a really big role on people's perceptions of wildlife and nature. Yeah, that is interesting. I love hearing your perspective on all of that. And I could listen to you talk about bears all day, but <laughs> um, if listeners want to learn more about you and all of your amazing bear conservation work, how can they do that? Um, that's a good question. If, if they're interested in like the scientific papers, um, I'll have them on like my research gate, which is kind of like a LinkedIn for scientists. Um, Otherwise, I post on my social media somewhat regularly. It's definitely a mixture of like wildlife stuff and other rec recreation and personal things. Um, but I'm also involved with a nonprofit called IORA, which is the International Outdoor Recreation Asset Alliance. And we really focus on preserving areas that have a recreational value to people. We tend to focus on rock climbing areas, but we do all sorts of things there. And um, we talk about a lot of our efforts there and our, our research there. So that's also an organization that people can follow um, for, for more information. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book, on YouTube, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.